As Dr. Rich explained, conspiracy theories such as the ones discussed here, as well as additional expressions of anti-Semitism and other forms of hate, are becoming more widespread. This is particularly due to the growth of the internet and social media, where hateful and conspiratorial content can take on an aura of authenticity and is able to enter the private spheres of billions. If we look at social media and try to figure out if there's a scope of hatred or anti-Semitism, I think you have to conclude that there is no scope in a sense, that, it, that it's, it's, it's all over in almost any form that you can consider. Um, having researched the internet, hate on the internet for close to 20 years or over 20 years, I could tell you that there is no group on the internet that is not threatened and does not have manifestations of hate aiming and targeting it. And at the same time, there's almost no group that does not have haters or um, bigots and, and, and people who are prejudiced from within their own midst as well. Um, so it really is an equal opportunity offender or, or provides the opportunity, the opening for equal opportunity offenders. Um, what you do have, though, I think, is that it, by the virtue of its being anonymous and by virtue of the culture that we've created, it removes inhibitions that had formerly had been in place uh, in, in society in general and in, in human interaction in particular. Um, the internet allows, social media allows people to just go on, um, immediately provide a very emotional setting an emotional response or a release to whatever thought they're thinking. And instead of filtering it, instead of thinking about it, it comes out in immediate scope. And it also has created a, uh, an environment where any kind of statement is legitimized. You can say anything, you can feel anything, you can pretend to be any kind of authority. Um, it, it, it is really a sort of, uh, verbal Wild West and rhetorical Wild West in the sense that there is no um, editorial function there. And while many people claim and think that that is the virtue and the beauty of the internet, the downside is that it opens the door to these kind of expressions. It's almost been 30 years since the very beginning of internet use that we have seen the presence of anti-Semitism online, Holocaust denial, and it has grown disproportionately in that time, considering the size of the Jewish population, the use by neo-Nazis and anti-Semites has been incredible. In their own words, they've described it as more powerful than a sword, um, better than a march, because they can, instead of physically having to distribute material, for example, and exposing themselves to scorn or even risk, they can do it behind an electronic wall. It empowers them by creating the feeling of a global organization, they're no longer isolated in a basement in some garage or, or you know, some dingy apartment someplace, but now they're linked to comrades all over the world. They provided merchandising opportunities where material from t-shirts to music to books were sold. Um, they were able to target specific audiences to have pages directed at women, at prisoners in, in, in prisons, at children, at academics or intellectuals. Um, at political, at nationalities or ethnic groups. So all that then really exploded further when social media became prevalent and you didn't have to go through a website or you know, Internet 2.0 and you created the opportunity for people to vent however as they will and which fed a networking of this kind of uh, um, approach and we are seeing that uh, the results of that in many cases in today's world. We can see, then, that the various social networks active online today serve as major platforms through which hateful and abusive content is transmitted and spread. This negative function of social media is one which many hadn't foreseen in the early days of these networks. Ten years ago, in my world at least, social media were considered with a very positive image. They were connected with some social movements, that were protesting for good ideas. They were connected with some uh, revolution for democracy in the Arab and Muslim world, in many countries. They were connected with Occupy Wall Street, Indignados. I mean, I mean, there was a lot of sympathy. And it was the idea that social media were connected with universalism. But today, it's a very contrary. Most of the people that work on social media say it is not universalism. It's the contrary. 
groups were, uh, groups communicate w in their social media. And, it's a, a, and social media are a deep element in communicating hate, violence, and, and uh, uh, negative uh, images of Jews or other points. So if you want to understand post-truth, if you want to understand fake news, if you want to understand the contrary of universal values, just look at the, the way social media act. So I consider that today this is true. Social media have a devastating effect because if I am a professor and if I say uh, uh, Auschwitz existed, it's something. Or if I am a good journalist, or if I am a serious political man. But people, when they don't trust politicians, professors, journalists, what do they do? They find by themselves their truth on internet and on the social media. And, and, and so they will be happy to join the social media that will give them what they want to be given. And here begins the problem. So really, I consider that today, social media, because they don't open the world to those people that participate in the social media, but because on the contrary, they, make, uh, uh, they built a wall and these people are in, inside, they have a very devastating role, including in, in anti-Semitism. Though there are, of course, many positive aspects to social media, we must ask ourselves what is it about these online social networks that has enabled them to become such major tools in the dissemination of hateful content and in the spread of incitement and intolerance, including anti-Semitism. In order to address this question, let's first turn to a phenomenon familiar to all of us today, virality, and the role it plays in the creation and sharing of hateful content. Virality is a phenomenon. When we're talking about virality, we're talking about social information flows that flow between one person to another. It doesn't matter which medium it is. And then it happens very fast to a lot of people, to very far-reached networks. So the idea of the speed and the reach are very critical when we talk about virality. Most of the information is not viral in the world. Most of the information is regular. It is exposed to 100 uh, people, 200 people. When we're talking about virality, we're talking about by minutes. It can get to millions of people and uh, sometimes it's a very provocative types of content. Since most of the information doesn't become viral, things that do become viral have to be spectacular, have to be exceptional, have to be remarkable. And usually those types of content tend to be either type of content that are exceptional and type of content that we don't tend to see. For example, incitement, incitement like misogenic, like homophobia, like anti-Semitism, like anti-Muslims. Those type of content usually is, um, tends to, to uh, flow more fast and, more, and reach more people than the regular types of information flow. People expect the exceptional content uh, to become viral, and when they expect it, they usually share it more. So we tend to see that, that regular information tends to kind of like flow and then decay, while viral information that, that is part of incitement, harassment, and sometimes I would say ex, uh, extreme political um, statements tend to become more and more viral. An important stage in both understanding and confronting the spread of hateful content on social media is becoming familiar with the way the information is distributed and flows on these networks. I, I think as researchers, one of the fascinating things that we see in social networks is that the information doesn't flow on a regular pace. It's, it's not a de democratic process. It's not an equal process. So what we see is that we see that the information is very biased. And when we're talking about biasing the information flows, we're talking really about uh, five different phenomena. One is the power law. So the idea is that most of the content and most of the attention of users is concentrated in a very few small number of, I would say, suppliers, I would say, uh, platforms and big corporations. They tend to have the attention of most of the people. So that changes the way that where we kind of uh, focus our attention to. The second bias is homophily, the idea of where people tend to come and, and communicate with people that are very like-minded. 
And it can happen on different types of levels. For example, ethnicity, religiosity, uh, gender, uh, age, et cetera, et cetera. And what, ha what we see here in, uh, for example, in this slide is we see a situation where the discourse and the discussion in social networks tend to happen in what we call in filter bubbles or in camps. So, for example, in this example, we see that the, the, the narrative, what you see here is the discussion at the time of the protective edge operation. The discussion along the lines of the Israeli narrative is one side. People talk about that, but they don't talk with the other camp, which is the discussions along the side of the Palestinian narratives. And this is, goes also to political issues. For example, we see in elections very consistently that uh, democratic or liberal views usually talks with themselves and republicans or more conservative views usually talk with themselves and there is no what we call cross discussion between the camps homophily usually what happens in homophily is that it separates in silos the different discussions the third thing that we see in uh, social networks is polarization which comes usually with harassment and incitement. So my, usually my statements and my arguments in life outside of social networks would tend to be less polarized and less, uh, I would say, with uh, levels of incitement and harassment than in social networks. And we see it again and again, there are research that show that, that people are more polarized on the internet. And then we see gatekeepers. Gatekeepers is the fourth uh, biasing of information flows, the gatekeepers have the power to uh, manipulate and to, um, to take uh, the information flows toward direction that serves their interests. And now the big question starts with who are the gatekeepers and how can we identify them? Gatekeepers are entities, it can be a person, it can be an organization, it can be uh, a government that controls information. So the, the process of gatekeeping is the control of information. And, but the gatekeepers are not the usual elites that we used to see before. The, the elites like, for example, newspapers, mass media, governments. Today, the gatekeepers are you and me. Today, the gatekeepers are every users. They can become gatekeeper if they control the information. It, when I decide to share information, I become a gatekeeper because my decision to share that information is a very proactive decision. And that makes, uh, basically, I, I'm, I'm becoming part of the big information flow, which currently I don't see but I can become a gatekeeper. And the fifth th thing that is very important to remember is what we call following the herd. So the tendency in social networks to share information, not because you're interested in the content, but because a million people or a billion people shared it. We are following the herd. And then again, the question is, who is the herd and who's basically directing the herd and what are the interests behind the scene to direct the herd? How then can the various forms of online hate including anti-Semitism, be confronted. It is clear that social media has become an integral and in many ways extremely positive part of our contemporary existence. However, we do have to understand its downsides and dangers and attempt to address and minimize them. So if the gatekeepers usually are platforms that uh, control the information, not necessarily in the bad way, they control the information because in sometimes content needs to be controlled. Uh, but then comes the question of what can we do if viral information tends to become viral and to get to more information to more people? Is there a tendency or should we uh, control that information? Should we stop that information in some cases? Should we remove content? We do want to stop racism. We do want to stop uh, anti-Semitism. But a lot of time we have to know that content uh, that is provocative we should be careful not to be fast and not to uh, remove it very fa very quickly because we want to make sure that a lot of voices are heard. However, we should find the red lines of where incitement for harassment of, and where incitement for racism and for violence become, uh, I would say, too exceptional for the society, for a democratic society to accept to itself. About the question of what can we do, it's a, it's a big question and, and I'm not sure that we do have a finite answer because virality cannot be controlled. However, we can do certain things to minimize the phenomena and that's something that we can do. For example, we can ask the platform to be more transparent to users because if we know how platforms remove and how they filter and how they decide to minimize the exposure to certain content, then us, 
the public has a say in it. So we can have a say in the process. Where, for example, we can create a public committees uh, for deciding what are the red lines because every country has different kind of values. So platforms have a lot of power to decide what to remove and what not to remove. So for example, uh, by the Facebook files that were just exposed by The Guardian uh, not long ago, it showed that anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic uh, content, usually they don't tend to delete it from certain countries, while in other countries they allow it uh, to circulate on their platforms. In this case, it was Facebook. So different platforms have different practices and different ways of dealing with such content. And um, this is why we need to think about how we enhance the ability of platform to deal with those uh, type of content. In many cases, platforms don't want to deal with this. They don't like to deal with this because when they deal with this, they become the arbitrator. However, in today's world, in social networks, there is no other solution of the platform other than intervening in certain cases. Second thing is to uh, extend and to increase uh, the knowledge of people about their power. People don't understand when they click on the share of content that is very hateful. Uh, that's a problem. That content can become viral. That content eventually can become uh, a lead to act against certain types of people, for example, Jews, for example, immigrants, and other types of people. So people have to understand the power that they have in their hand and to understand that their keyboard may be sometimes like a gun. That's the second thing. And the third thing is really, I think leaders today have to realize that the political benefit of gaining more likes and more people while losing a lot of the trust that the people has in the government, that the people has in the politicians, in the leadership, has to stop. I mean, politicians need to make this decision and stop using virality as a kind of a weapon for them to gain more political uh, benefits.